Hey everyone, this is Eve Picker, and if you listen to this podcast series, you're going to learn how to make some change. Thanks so much for joining me today for the latest episode of Impact Real Estate Investing. My guest today is Jeremy McLeod. Jeremy is the founding director of Breathe Architecture, an architecture studio located in Melbourne, Australia. Breathe is a world-class architecture firm, delivering fabulous projects to its clients. But Jeremy isn't resting on his laurels. He really cares about the ever-widening gap between those who have wealth and those who do not. And so 12 years ago, he embarked on a journey to deliver the sustainability and affordability in one housing model. His first project, The Commons, was met with huge success. Now, with a waiting list of over 8,000 buyers, he intends his Nightingale project to be an open-source housing model led by architects. Be sure to go to evepicker.com to find out more about Jeremy on the show notes page for this episode, and be sure to sign up for my newsletter so you can access information about impact real estate investing and get the latest news about the exciting projects on my crowdfunding platform, Small Change. So hi, Jeremy. Hi, Eve. It's really lovely to finally meet you. Uh, yeah. And I, I did think that we were doing this uh, interview over Zoom, so I was surprised to see you in my office in Australia. Oh, Thanks you for thought coming. it was by Zoom? I told <laughs> you it was local. <laughs> it's really fun to be recording in your beautiful b- building and actually see it because I've uh, really wanted to do that for a long time. So you're an architect and you've taken your fabulous education and you're working on a new housing model for Melbourne, Australia, where we're recording today. And I wanted to talk about what's kind of driven you to think about that, to develop a better housing model, and what even that means. Well, it's not hard to build a better housing model in Australia. It's because our, our housing system is broken. I mean, the interesting thing about Australia is that we're the richest country per capita in the world, yet we have one of the highest uh, greenhouse gas emissions per capita in the world. But importantly, we have over, at the last census, we have over 116,000 homeless people here. So for an incredibly wealthy country with lots of opportunity, there's incredible inequity here. And that that inequity is growing. In countries, you know, um, Scandinavian countries or uh, Austria or uh, Germany or... uh, uh, anywhere in Europe, basically, there's an affordable housing requirement. In London, there's inclusion rezoning, which requires you to put in 20% affordable housing. In New York, there's inclusion rezoning. Um, but in Australia, there is no inclusion rezoning, which means that the private uh, housing developers can build whatever they want uh, without including any affordable housing. So they're not held accountable for the economy at all? No, absolutely not. And so in, in that instance, then you would assume it's the responsibility of the state to provide housing for its people. But in the 1980s, uh, state governments around the country started divesting their responsibility for housing their people through a public housing system and started giving it to uh, smaller not-for-profit organisations, church-based or faith-based organisations or community housing providers to provide housing. And they started selling down their assets and stopped, importantly, stopped building housing. And so what we've seen is this steady growth of homelessness at the same time and a steady growth in wealth in this country. As an architect, I mean, before I was an architect, uh, I studied environmental design. Mm -hmm. So I I understand, you know, inherently the issues around climate change. I've looked at the issues around the, the last IPCC report, which says that, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to find two billion refugees globally, like a billion coming out of Africa and a billion coming out of Asia, where do you think those people are going to be? And that we also understand that the people at the edges are the people that suffer the most in times of climate change. So I, I'm incre- I, I think that climate change and homelessness and housing are all intrinsically linked mm-hmm. um, and that we need to resolve both those issues simultaneously. And we need to, we need to resolve those issues very rapidly. The state doesn't <laughs> has divested their responsibility and the private sector obviously is interested in returning um, profit to their shareholders, right. not in uh, delivering kind of, you know, on corporate responsibility goals that, you know, may or may not exist 
within you know their their boardrooms. So the idea for us was that we would build um, a model, a prototype, basically, to encourage uh, private developers to change the way that they worked. And our contention was that you can build housing that simultaneously builds community, that is sustainable, and that is that is affordable, and that returns some fair and reasonable return back to investors. And you thought this was an important role for you as an architect? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's an um, unusual <laughs> role for an architect. Yeah, look, I mean... Uh, of course, my, my first love is architecture. I would love to just design great buildings all day, every day. I would love to build great housing. But uh, as an architect yourself, you would understand that to make a great project, you need three things. You need a great architect, you need a great builder, and you need a great client. And so if we're trying to build great housing projects uh, in Melbourne, it was, you know, let's assume for a minute that Breathe Architecture was a great uh, architect. I can find a great builder, but I couldn't find a great client. So for us to be able to deliver on the projects that we needed to, uh, I felt like the only way was to become our own client. That makes sense. Yeah, and to basically build a system that could be replicated. That was kind of the birth of Nightingale. Right. I watched your TEDx talk, which I thought was really interesting, and you said that there's a, a population explosion going on here, which I know about. I think I didn't realise it was quite so rapid, but how many people in Melbourne today? So there's 5 million at the moment. We're going towards 8 million by 2050. It's essentially 100,000 Melburnians every year for the next 30 years. I think it's one of the fastest growing cities in the world, right? Yeah, so interestingly, we've always been smaller than Sydney. Um, we've always been the little sister to Sydney, and we're now about to outstrip Sydney yeah. in terms of population. Yeah, I can feel it every time I come and visit. Yeah. You talked in that TEDx talk about urban compression versus urban sprawl, which I thought was a really great way of describing what's available and what's probably true in most of the United States as well. The idea being that urban compression is like warehousing people in really dense, maybe warehousing isn't a fair way <laughs> to say it, but, but building very dense high-rise uh, housing products in inner cities versus urban sprawl, which is building, you know, the, the American Australian dream of a, a house on a lot, right? Yeah. And not much in between. Yeah. So what's in between look like? Well, I mean, the interesting thing here is it's all about politics, right? So in the centre of our city, it's all old commercial uh, land. It was a commercial centre, so it's easy to build 108-storey towers there to warehouse people, um, so to say, because no one objects to that because everyone sees that if someone builds 108 storeys there, then I can then build my um, old shop to 108 storeys and I'll get that value uplift. So it's a, it's it's, a, gr it's right. a, great, it's a great capital game. Right. Um, on the cities, on the cities, um, or in the middle ring suburbs. So, in all the places really close to um, infrastructure, schools, hospitals, uh, work, uh, public transport, those areas there are all held by um, by the city's wealthiest um, wealthiest population. They're uh, well moneyed, they're well resourced, um, and they've got a very very loud political voice. And they say very clearly to uh, the state planning minister um, and to the state politicians that they don't want any increase on den in density around them, but like San Francisco. Instead, they've got no issue with density per se, just not in my backyard. Yes, and so, NIMBY, uh, right? NIMBY, so that's right, so they're, they're the NIMBYs. So yeah. um, instead what happens is that if, you, if you're a first home buyer in Australia, if you could possibly afford to be a first home buyer here, you can't afford to buy a house in the middle ring suburbs close to work, close to hospitals, close to schools. Yeah, you're very far away. You end up very far away. Um, so in Sydney, uh, the, I, I saw a graph recently where if you're a nurse and you work in a hospital and you're a first home buyer, you're, a, you're an hour and a half away from the nearest hospital that you were working. Wow. Which and is I, three in hours effect commute those, every day. <laughs> yeah, so the, in, in effect those people are really the ones that need to be closer to the city and need to have, have access to public transit Absol um, absolutely. and all of, all of those things to make to make their lives work. Well, to make the city work for yeah. all the well-moneyed people That's as well. Right. You yeah. know, 
<laughs> so the city works because of those people. Uh, and so, and the other issue that we've got in Melbourne is, is it's this incredible sp- sprawl issue where currently we have built over 40% of our farming land. So we've got 60% of our farming land yeah. left, but our population is growing at in, uh, unprecedented rates. At the same time, we've got pressure where China is coming in and buying our farming resources. So they're buying, uh, you know, beef, dairy, uh, big farmland. So I worry about food security for, uh, you know, for Australians in the future when there's 1.5 billion Chinese and 600 million middle class Chinese, you know, um, and a time when food security becomes a big issue, all of our food right. will be being exported. Wow. <laughs> so I, I see that as this incredible, yeah. this, this, this madness of us building over all of our good farming land. And then the other piece of it is, I think you and I agree on this, that many new buildings are built as a financial commodity and really they're really about making money, not about making place better, which is really disturbing to me because I think you can take the same money and build, you know, add to a city in a really meaningful way or not, right? So... Yeah, it's uh, looking at examples like there's a suburb in Sydney called Ultimo, and uh, over ninety percent of Ultimo has been bought by investors. So, essentially, um, a lot of our apartments, and and, and in Melbourne, uh, in and is that like little single family houses or no? So it's all apartments. It's all apartments. So the whole, uh, you know, nearly all. So of it's Ultimo. a bit of a ghost town then, or is it just all rental? Well, a lot of it is rental. You know, until very recently, um, there were no foreign ownership maximums on how much you, how much of an apartment or or how much of a building you could sell to foreign owners. So um, we were we had Australian developers selling 100 percent of their buildings to um, offshore waiting lists in Kuala Lumpur or Shanghai. We would find that you know whole buildings are owned by offshore investors that have never been to the city or um, may have never seen the actual apartments. They've bought it off a spreadsheet through through an investment vehicle. Um, and, of course, when you get a city built on a spreadsheet, um, it becomes a pretty, uh, a pretty sad outcome. Right, 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 right. So your journey started in 2007 when you, uh, you bought the piece of land we're yeah. sitting on right now, right? Yeah. And um, so where did you begin? Well, so maybe I'll I'll go back to 1972 when I was born. Oh, um, so <laughs> that's fair so so I was my parents were a couple of hippies. When I was about 11, my dad took me to Old Parliament House to um, lobby the government then about public housing in a suburb called Fitz, uh, Footscray in in Melbourne. So then I go and study uh, sustainability, uh, environmental design, and then I go on to be an architect where. My focus is on studying housing. I then uh, work for a big firm, and when I'm working in that big firm, I end up working on you know 88 story towers, which just you know and the toilet details, right? Yeah, yeah, lots of toilet details, <laughs> lots stair of stairs. Details, yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> um, but it was the the last building that I worked on in that big practice. Um, I was working on the car park for six weeks. Oh, uh, that's really you know, and I thought that, that I thought that, that it was crushing, and I didn't think it was a good use of my time. Or, uh, you know, it wasn't something that I was interested in. You know, housing cars, what a meaningless uh, act. Yes. So I started Breathe Architecture in 2001. Uh, When I started uh, Breathe Architecture, the simple idea was that every room would have a window so the occupants could breathe. So in 2007, uh, as as an architect working in the city, we'd been working for a bunch of property developers. It was... um, It was... Disappointing. We resigned a couple of commissions. We got fired from a couple of commissions because uh, we wouldn't back down on certain things like, you know, we wouldn't take the solar panels off the roof. <laughs> we wouldn't take the... the Ooh, that's kind we, of basic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we wouldn't take we wouldn't take the solar hot water out of the building. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we got winter sun into the building, you know, like really simple things that we wouldn't back down on. Um, uh, so after that, we decided that we would partner with some other architects and we would try and embark on building a prototype building. Um, so uh, there were six of us, six architects. We all came together. We bought this site. It was originally called Nightingale um, back in 2007, and it took us until 2013 to finish it. Wow. So it took us six years in the middle of it, uh, thanks to uh, subprime issues in the United States. 
um, uh, the financial crisis washed across the shores to Australia. By the time I needed finance to build this, uh, the idea was that it would be a zero car, zero carbon building, a building that focused on sustainability and community and affordability. By the time I needed to get money for that, it was after the financial crisis had, had actually um, beat into Australia as well, and we lost our funding to build it. And so then... And why I, did you lose the funding? Is it because banks just got more conservative or...? Yeah, banks just got more conservative. So I mean, same, uh, same reasons I saw in the States. Yeah, and look, and, and I actually don't blame the bank. I think that leading up to, you know, lead, leading up to the global financial crisis... You know, it was too easy to get money. So as a group of six architects, you know, we were about to borrow $7.1 million, you know, Mm -hmm. on a kind of prototype project that hadn't been built before. So I can understand why Mm -hmm. uh, the bank was was nervous by the time, you know, we got into, you know, 2010, 2011. We we went and met with a whole different uh, raft of impact investors. We met a group called Small Giants, um, and Small Giants bought the project off us. They renamed the project uh, from Nightingale to the Commons uh, because their marketing team thought that was a good idea. I don't, I can live, I can live with it, but you know, what's what's in a, what's in a name? Um, but anyway, the Commons then ended up um, being delivered, uh, and in 2014, it won the National Award for Sustainability, oh, wow. the National Award for Housing. And it became, you know, a kind of a destination for people to come and look at. And so in the following year, we opened the building up for tours. We took every property developer in the city through. Um, we took uh, Melbourne residents through and we talked a lot about, you know, the importance of change in our housing model. And then the idea was off the back of that that we would influence change in the marketplace. Well, that was one of my questions here. Has your work influenced the status quo? Well, the interesting thing was that when we when we completed the Commons and it won all those awards and it got lots of media and lots of people were interested, the answer to that is no. It was seen as an exception to the rule. Um, and so the idea was that the pilot project or the prototype project would influence change, but it was seen as an outlier. Interesting. And ju- like just backing up a bit, so what is different about the Commons, this building? Yeah, so the Commons, uh, I, I think that... If you want to build something that's uh, affordable uh, and sustainable simultaneously, every project manager says that you can't do that. Every project manager will tell you that sustainability is more expensive. And so to build sustainability means that you can't build it affordably. And so instead, Bonnie Herring, uh, who was the project architect at Breathe, who led this project, her whole approach was one of uh, sustainability through reductionism. So she constantly interrogated the idea is, if we don't need it, take it out. Uh, Ask people what it is that they actually need, not what they want from some real estate. What they think they need, what they think they need because everyone else has it, right? Yeah. But when when we started talking to people, the interesting thing was that what people actually wanted was space light, uh, outlook, uh, plants, you know, uh, natural materials. No one wanted marble bench tops, you know, a thousand down lights, white shag pile carpet, a swimming pool, <laughs> three bathrooms, you know. What people actually wanted, we were finding, was just kind of really good, um, meaningful housing. So our approach on the commons was, yes, sustainability through reductionism. If I step you through that, you'll see that it makes total sense. So... The first thing is um, we took the basement car parking out, and why is that important? Um, so for a $7 million building, the basement car park was going to cost $750,000. So by taking that out, um, we reduced the build cost by uh, over 10%. But importantly, we just we didn't just take reduce the price of all the apartments by $30,000 each. We also took some of that money and put it into um, making the rooftop garden you know, really incredible. Where you would have ordinarily had um, a driveway coming in off the street um, and a ramp up and then a ramp down to get into that driveway and a roller door to close that driveway off to get down to the basement car park. Instead instead of having that there, we put in a wine shop where the driveway and the ramp would have been. And then we sold the wine shop for $425,000. Right. We then took the revenue from the wine shop and we used it to increase all of our glazing to get the best 
possible double glazing that money could buy in the country at the time. We we pumped up all of the insulation on our walls, so we made all of our walls fatter, we got better insulation in them. So we used that money to improve the thermal envelope of the building. Then that then made the apartments perform. So we have a star rating system here. So you need kind of, you know, here a minimum of five stars or an average of six stars to be able to um, get, get a building permit here. And instead we set the minimum at seven and a half stars here. The, the panacea is 10 stars means you don't require any energy for heating or cooling, which would be incredible. But when we got to seven and a half stars, our thermal modelling told us that the building could operate within a thermal comfort range of between 19 and 27 degrees. And the interesting thing is that that's kind of the European thermal comfort range. The Germans deem that to be... Oh, sorry, that's all Celsius. Right. Like Fahrenheit. No, no, I got it. That's, I'll let, I'll let that's about... Oh, I can't do that in my head right now, but that's... Um, <laughs> Yeah. I'll let you do the conversion We'll later. figure it out later. <laughs> but but basically, um, the Australian thermal comfort range, you know, is generally being seen to be, you know, between 19 and 22 degrees. Mm-hmm. So by stretching it out from 19 to 27, the German comfort range, all of a sudden we found that we didn't need to put air conditioning in. When we take air conditioning out, we save another 5% out of the building costs throughout the building and obviously drastically reduce the operational costs and operational energy required in the building. Normally, every two-bedroom apartment uh, in Melbourne at that time was being designed with two bathrooms, so a primary um, bathroom and then an ensuite to the master bedroom. Um, instead, we took out all of the ensuites, so we only had one bathroom in each uh, apartment. Mm-hmm. We kept them at the same size. Um, so the apartments, by taking out the really energy-intensive detail heavy bathrooms Mm -hmm. we saved about ten thousand dollars out of the cost of each of the apartments and all the living rooms got seven square meters bigger which is uh 70 square feet Mm -hmm. we took out all of the um all of the individual laundries out of each of the apartments and instead put one beautiful laundry on the rooftop which overlooks an incredible rooftop garden and the city now you could save the money on all the stacks correct and the space in the unit correct so everyone's it's exactly right. So everyone's and the cost of all the appliances. Exactly. And the so, energy cost. Yeah. Exactly. You get it. You get it. So yeah. we do that over and over again. We have one shared um, internet connection. So we bring fibre into the building and we share that um, internet throughout the building. So we pay for it at one point and then we use bulk buying to share that for everyone. So mm-hmm. everyone gets really, really cheap, really, really fast internet in um, a city where the internet here is it's expensive. Not and that's not, it's not it's very good, yeah. Generally, know, to buy as a retailer, it's expensive <laughs> and it's poor quality here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we do the same thing with the power through an embedded network. Um, so it's this constant so idea So it's a very sh- pragmatic approach. It's really pragmatic. Really pragmatic to chisel away of what's really necessary in a building and um, and really make it work. Yeah, and think about, I love it. you know, what can you share? It's all yeah. about sharing and using, uh, you know, bulk buying and trying to get maximum utilisation. So, you know, like our our laundry, for example, yeah, there's six washing machines, which get used a lot more than having, you know, 24 washing machines that get used, you know, very infrequently. I think um, a lot of people might find that concept difficult. (laughs) <laughs> but I suppose you don't need to find a lot for one building, do you? You just well, well. I mean, initially when we started, when we finished this project, and we started work on Nightingale One, and I'll tell you in a minute why we started Nightingale One. But when we started the Nightingale One, there were eleven people that had written to us to say, "If you're going to build another building like the Commons, can you please let us know?" And so we put those eleven people on a waiting list. That waiting list now, through Nightingale Housing, is at eight and a half thousand people. So apparently wow, there's, there's eight and a half thousand people. Amazing. In, <laughs> so apparently there's eight and a half thousand people in Melbourne that would be happy to have um, a cheaper apartment with a bigger living room, uh, with a beautiful shared rooftop laundry, with one bathroom, um, with no individual or private car parking, but with a free car share membership to you know a twenty cars parked within a four hundred meter radius. And to be fair, in a beautifully designed building. Thank you. Well, (laughs) Well, I think that's. I'll sign up for the waiting list. Well, yeah, I I think (laughs) the the great thing about you know being your own client is that uh, you can definitely uh, make sure that the architecture is what it should be. 
So, and, and actually, for people listening, the thing that's also very incredible here is the commons. This building sits right on a railway line. You can see the, you can see the station out of the windows. So, um, it's really, um, it's really a transit oriented development as yeah. well, which really makes it much easier not to have a car. Yeah, absolutely. So there's the, the train station right next door, the bike path right next door. The 503 bus and then the tram lines. And a garage so packed full of bikes. Yeah, so we do have the highest ratio of bikes to apartments in the country. Yeah. But the interesting thing about that is that we just looked at what were the bike ratios used in the Netherlands and then we used those and brought that over here. So it's not, um, none of this is rocket science. So it's it's right. just, you know, how's it been done? So well you, you, had an, you had investors in this project and how did they do? Um, so in, in the commons, there was, um, there was six architects and all of us, uh, and we all invested. So Tamara and, and I, my partner and I, um, yeah, we literally bet the house on it. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, out of the commons, we did, um, at the end of the project, um, when small giants, we bought the site, we resigned the site, we got the DA approval, we got the price in place. Then we had to sell the project to small giants. They sold, they bought the project back off us. And at that point, we, we had bought the site for 545,000 and we sold it back to them for $2 million. So theoretically. So how did they do? Um, they never they... actually, they never actually disclosed to me how okay. they did, but they have... built, they built an entire brand off the back of there you uh, go. the problems. <laughs> um, so but, it's... but, but in, 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 interestingly, Everything sold in the commons. The project was delivered, you know, on time and on budget. And, um, you know. And did it sell quickly? Yes. So that's in a time 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 when nothing else was. Yeah. That's probably a key thing in a project like this because having a couple of vacant units is your profit in a building like this. So. Yeah. That, that didn't happen here. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. So, um, so then, you know, the triple bottom line here actually made a financial return as well so it's a pretty strong argument for yeah. doing the right thing yeah how hard is it to find investors who really care about the triple <laughs> bottom line <laughs> well so maybe let me let me just come back to um the move from the commons to nightingale one okay. or, or why we started nightingale housing do you want to hear oh yeah absolutely so this idea that that the commons would drive change by being a prototype building. Um, and I, and I, I said before that it kind of failed because it was seen as the exception, not the rule. What we decided to do after that first, you know, after we got that wait list of 11 people was to, if, if the market wouldn't change, then we would drive change in the market and that we would continue to build buildings, um, until such a time as the market actually came to us, you know, until we didn't need to exist any longer. So we established Nightingale Housing, we got some corporate sponsorship, we got a government grant, we got a grant from the National Australia Bank. Um, so we built a really small team of about three of us um, and we embarked on Nightingale One. Uh, and and that's, so, that's non-profit driven now, Yeah, right? so, so not, Nightingale One was still delivered under uh, the way that we wrote that feasibility study was that we capped the return at 15% per annum. And then we capped that return at, um, at a three year project timeline. So essentially it was a gross return of 45% over three years. So there was a lot of pressure on us to deliver that for our investors to deliver it within the three year time window. Um, so, um, and to get, to get, we started, we tried to do that at 10% per annum. And when we tried to raise impact investment to build a carbon neutral building. Too much free. Right? <laughs> so when we tried to raise equity, so we, I spoke to probably 60 architects in the city because I wanted the architects to invest in it. I wanted the architects to own it. I wanted to share the IP with the architects so that they would take it and scale the idea. I met with architect after architect for about, you know, six weeks. And we ended up getting 27 investors all putting in a hundred thousand dollars each. Um, a lot of people with not a lot of money, uh, borrowing against their homes to invest money in. And when we first said we wanted 10, we were going to want to return 10% per annum, our first investor said that wasn't enough. It wasn't, it didn't match the risk versus return matrix for them. Um, and so they wanted 15% return. So we ended up taking all the equity. Uh, so in Nightingale 1, it was about a $10 million project and we raised $2.7 million in equity um, with a cap return of 15% per annum. 
going forward from that, so Nightingale 2 was a similar and did model. did you return the 15%? Yeah, absolutely. We, we returned. And so the way that, we, that, that our model worked was that we have a construction contingency in the project. And so after we returned all the money to the shareholder, exactly as we said in our prospectus, at the end of the project, the money left over from the contingency, instead of keeping that as developer, which would developer would normally keep that as cream, we then gave that back to the residents. So the residents that had balloted into the building, because by that time there was more demand than there was supply after the success of the Commons. So we had to run a public ballot where the mayor drew the names for the apartments out of a hard hat. Wow. Um, and those residents, those lucky residents, at the end of the project, their apartments were about $90,000 under market. And when we finished the project, uh, we gave the building a check for $109,000 back. Wow. And so just to be clear, because in the US, apartments are usually, well, this, this is all for sale yeah. at this point, right? Yes. Which is really what the market is in, in Melbourne. Yeah, absolutely. It's all, you know. Uh, it's all for sale. It, everything's for sale. <laughs> yeah. Which is in itself an interesting discussion. That's really amazing. So now, now that was the first project. What's happening next? Well, so after we, uh, at the completion of Nightingale 1, and then we did Nightingale 2, which is just completed, um, and Nightingale Brunswick East, which is just completed. And how um, many units are each of those? Like so Nightingale 1, so the Commons is 24 apartments. Nightingale 1 is 20 apartments. Nightingale 2 is 20 apartments. Nightingale Brunswick East is a hybrid with a property developer. So that's 38 Nightingale apartments and about uh, 25 straight-to-market apartments. So that's a real mixed income. Yeah, is, yeah. and that's interesting. It's interesting. The developer was so good, um, they funded the whole project. They agreed to um, run everything transparently with us. So it's, you know, so Nightingale's principles are that it has to be minimum seven and a half stars, has to be carbon neutral in operations. It can't have natural gas plumped into it. Uh, it has to have, you know, all of those Nightingale principles. And we've got a, like a, um, we also have a restrictive caveat, which says that if we're selling a Nightingale apartment to you and we're capping the maximum sale price that we're selling to you based on a maximum return to investors, then you can't sell it tomorrow. And, right. And, yeah, that and, makes sense. And make yeah. a massive profit. And so, so you want to keep it affordable. Yeah, absolutely. And so this developer, Lucent, agreed to do all of those things. They handled all the delivery side. And the benefit, the upside for them was that um, they were trying to sell apartments in a street where someone else was about to sell 700 apartments, someone else was selling 60 apartments. There was about 1,000 apartments on, wow. on the market. They They... They broke their building in half, did half Nightingale, half straight to market. We said that we would do that only if that the entire project, including their straight to market apartments, were carbon neutral in operations and met the minimum seven and a half star requirement. They agreed to do that. The Nightingale apartments went to ballot. They balloted in one day. So they sold all of 38 apartments in one day. That's astounding. Which then got them the sales target that they needed to get financial close from the bank to cover the debt which meant that they could then demolish the building, start their um, the basement construction, right, right, right. And, which gave them a massive program jump on all the other um, buildings. They then so opened their straight-to-market sales, and some of the people that had missed out on the Nightingale ballot went and bought there because they could afford to, but also they were interested in the sustainability idea of carbon neutrality um, and the idea of community. And then that gave them kind of a, a, a massive differentiator in the marketplace. Yeah, it's a brand, isn't it? And so when no one else was selling anything in that street, they sold um, their 25 apartments in three weeks, which was, you know, unheard of. So at that time. I don't know what balloting is. Can you explain that to me? How? Sure. So um, ordinarily, the way that a straight to market developer would sell their property is that they would in, in, employ a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. The real estate agent generally charges a fee of about 2.5%. Two five percent. Let's let's call Actually it two cheap. Yeah, to the well, well, let's let's call it. So there's two different ways you can sell in Australia. But if you if you employ a real estate agent here, they'll charge you two percent of the gross revenue of the project. Mm -hmm. So if the if the project is a ten million dollar project, they'll charge you two hundred thousand dollars. If it's a twenty million dollar project, they'll charge you four hundred thousand dollars. But they're going to sell all the units for that. Yeah, that's right. That's, okay. They're going to sell all the units for that. If if you historically had trouble selling, you would go to financial advisors in inverted commas who are meant to be independent and they could sell your uh, apartments to um, people looking for investment advice and they might charge 6 or 7%. Wow. 
Okay. Um, uh, I think they're trying to outlaw that at the moment, <laughs> because because it's because their their commission obviously makes it difficult. The rate of their commission is so high, it makes it difficult for them to make independent uh, advice about what to buy into or what not to. But Nightingale says no real estate agents, no sales, no marketing. Instead, it has a series of information nights. It talks to all the purchasers and it provides information, fearless information, um, warts and all about the great things about the project and the not so great things about it. So for the commons, for example, or Nightingale One, we talk about all the great things, but we also say that it's right next to the train line. So the great thing about that is that it's really close, but it also means that the train runs 24 hours um, you know, on a Friday and Saturday night, and if you've got your window open, you know, you can hear it. You're going to hear it, yeah. You know, it's a very, very, um, it's a place of urban flux and that where you see all the single-storey warehouses now, it will be a construction site for the next five years. So we talk about all those things openly. So how do you find those people, though? How do they find you? I don't know. Um, (laughs) No, so... so, That's really great. (laughs) uh, Look, we don't have a, you know, we don't have a marketing team. Um, We had some political trouble on Nightingale 1 where we got a planning permit the developer next door uh, took us to and the appeals court here based on, you know, the fact that they didn't want us to sell apartments that were uh, 20% bigger, 20% cheaper and 120% better than theirs because I think that they thought that it might provide a market problem for them. They took us to the appeals court and they that was well funded by that developer and we weren't particularly well funded. You know, they had a, you know, a good legal team and then they had our permit stripped from us, so they, they got our permit taken off us. Oh. Um, it's a it's a very, very strange system, planning system here where... Um, I know that now. <laughs> where, where individuals can veto um, oh. a, a local government decision. It's very interesting. Um, so we then had to lodge a, a, a new planning application from scratch on Nightingale 1. But the interesting thing was that when Nightingale 1 lost its planning permit at... at uh, at the appeals tribunal, the local media, uh, uh, particularly the liberal media, got very, very bent out of shape about uh, a project that was trying to deliver carbon neutral housing affordably, particularly trying to house millennials and first home buyers that had just been totally priced out of the market. And they got really bent out of shape that, that the one thing that that project was defeated on at the appeals court was on car parking. So basically the whole fight was that we didn't provide any car parking. And how our whole contention was that it sat on top of a train station next to a bike park. Well, people are unlikely to have cars. Well, all the, <laughs> 30% of them didn't have a licence, uh, 30% of them didn't have cars, um, and the last 40% um, had filled out stat decks saying that they would either get rid of their cars when they moved into the building or that they would garage them in surrounding buildings that have masses of basement car parking that is underutilised. Wow. Well. The biggest thing that happened for us was that um, it totally changed the landscape for us in terms of everyone suddenly had heard of Nightingale, heard about this kind so of that David. the bad thing was a great marketing. Yeah, the bad thing that, that, that nearly broke me emotionally, like the whole like Breathe architecture was like nearly broken the day after that. We couldn't believe what had happened in, um, in the 21st century in this city, given its incredible problems with climate change and kind of housing justice. And um, anyway... What we found was that uh, beyond that, mm-hmm. after that, um, our, our waiting list, like the week after that, our waiting list had jumped from 125 people to over 400 people. So wow. people had read it in the mainstream well, media. So and I, and so that's you're, wonderful. You're, you're absolutely right. Purpose. I think that was the start at which people actually started to hear about us. So, because we're running out of time, but I really want to know what's next. Hmm. Good question. So... Off the back of all the Nightingales we've done, we, what we found was that Nightingale 1 opposite the Commons, they're both really great, strong communities. But what we found is that there's, um, that they've actually started to work together as an organism. So the residents of the Commons and the residents of Nightingale 1 have worked together to lobby the council to close the street at the front. So in two years' time, the street will be closed and they're going to pull up the asphalt and they're going to replace it with grass and trees. Oh, well, that's wonderful. And so we started so to you've see... you've really built a community here. Yes. And, the, and importantly, what else we've seen is with those two buildings in close proximity to, to each other, that they've started to engage with other residents around. So it's not just individual communities, but um, everyone within that street now and across the railway lines and around the corner are all now kind of engaging in, you know, street parties, uh, garage sale days, you know, 
um, you know, Christmas parties uh, or just talking to each other as they go past. So there's no more anonymity. And so the big thing for us was how do we kind of learn from that? And so we bought seven sites, two streets south of the commons, um, and that's what's called Nightingale Village. So that's um, there was going to be seven buildings by seven architects, all carbon neutral communities, no individually owned cars, a car share hub for you know, 15 share cars, a consolidated bike park for 450 bikes, um, but importantly, no cars allowed on the streets. So on the streets above, again, pulling up the asphalt, replacing it with grass, trees, street furniture, um, and making it a place for pedestrians and cyclists. That's fabulous. Yeah, and so then, you know, at that scale, it jumped from a $10 million project to a $100 million project. Mm-hmm. We had a superannuation company, um, Hester, work with an organisation called Social Ventures Australia, an impact investor, and they put in $20 million worth of equity into that project. And then we've had um, a big bank here, National Australia Bank, essentially build a $2 billion housing innovation fund to step into the gap that our federal government and our state governments have left That's around fantastic. housing. That's fantastic, yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. It, so the debt will be funded out of that National Australia Bank um, uh, housing fund. So it's been incredible to get institutional finance coming in to make that happen. And then within that, obviously... We, we understand that and we understand that we're part of the gentrification problem and so we've been looking at this idea of inclusion rezoning and why can it work in London and why doesn't it work here or why isn't it called for here and basically the property council here lobbies our planning minister not to put in inclusion rezoning. They say that uh, we won't be able to afford it, that it will make the housing but untenable. But who does the property council represent? Property developers. Well, yeah, okay. And so... Um, and so we've decided at Nightingale Housing um, to now make sure that every project we do has 20% affordable housing in it, um, whether it, there's inclusion rezoning or not. And so what we are intend to do, so in Nightingale Village, we're now putting in 20% affordable housing. Um, and so within that, we want to prove to the planning minister um, uh, and to the government that you can put in uh, affordable housing, that you can salt and pepper it through your developments um, that it can be done well and it can be done elegantly um, and it can be done equitably and that if we can do it, there's no reason why a well-moneyed, publicly listed housing company or development company can't do it. So, yeah, look, the big push for us is now to actually make sure that, you know, we don't just... We just try and get better with every project. We try and think through what are the other issues that need to be done and then we'll deal with it. Okay, so I have a couple of really quick questions for you. Um, what trends in real estate development and architecture do you see emerging that, that you think are important for the future? Yeah, I mean, okay, yeah. So, look, I mean, we, we don't we don't plumb in natural gas and uh, all of our buildings are carbon neutral in operation, so it has to be powered by 100% certified green power or 100% renewables. So that's the measure that we use in Australia. Before we started Nightingale, everyone, t- every property developer told me that was impossible because people liked gas to cook on, to cook their, with their woks, you know, to have a wok burner in their apartments and that they would never go without gas. <laughs> Since um, Nightingale 1 has been complete, there are now five um, zero gas buildings within a one kilometre radius of Nightingale oh, that's 1. That's interesting, yeah. So we've shifted the bar on this idea of can I operate without gas? Am I, are my purchasers interested in carbon neutrality? And around here, absolutely. And, of course, if you don't have gas, you don't have to run the gas lines, and that is another savings Correct. in the building. Yeah. Correct. No gas meter room, no gas reticulation. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Wrap-up question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where do you think the future of real estate impact investing lies? Because you've been dealing with those impact investors from day one. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, it's a really good question. I think that, um, and I'm very, very interested in your model because I think that peer-to-peer lending is going to be really interesting um, about people being able to invest in projects of meaning. Uh, we see that the, the people of Melbourne who funded the early equity projects in Nightingale, they did it not so much for the return but because they cared about what was happening to our city um, what was happening... Um, That's why I built Small Change, because I think that people love the cities they're in and they just want to be part of making it better. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah. And so um, it's incredible to see Melburnians investing in 
in projects, you know, and, and, and in people with not a lot of money, but literally, yeah. you know, borrowing against their own home to help make this happen because they're, they're not just interested in making the city a, a more livable place, but they're also interested in, and they care about the future generations and what's happening to millennials being locked out of the housing market and wondering what's going to happen for them in housing security in the future. So, and I think that that's going to put a lot of pressure on institutional funds. We've got a lot of superannuation money in Australia. So do you think the interest requirement of 15% is going to drop? Well, the interesting thing is since the village, um, that's the last time we paid those rates. Oh, very good. So since then, we've got two new projects online and the offers that we're coming back in are now, you know, 13% and 11% because, you know, that's by the time we finish the village, that's 14 projects. And with a wait list of 8,500 people and if the single biggest risk in a project is sales and settlement right. with 8,500 people. There's not much risk. <laughs> no, <there's laughs> right, right. So I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank no, you very, very HC. much. <laughs> yeah, there's lots more I want to know, but um, uh, it's pretty fabulous what you're doing. Thank no. you. That was Jeremy McLeod of Breathe Architecture and the Nightingale Project. If you want to build something that is affordable and sustainable simultaneously, says Jeremy, every project manager in Melbourne will tell you you can't do it. So Breathe instead defined sustainability through reductionism. They discovered that what people actually want is really good and meaningful housing with space, light, great outlook and plants, not marble countertops, three bathrooms and shag carpet. They have achieved affordability and sustainability through reductionism. If you don't need it, take it out. You can find out more about impact real estate investing and access the show notes for today's episode at my website, evepicker.com. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to find out more about how to make money in real estate while building better cities. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And thank you, Jeremy, for sharing your thoughts with me. We'll talk again soon. But for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change. Be sure to go to evepicker.com and sign up for my free educational newsletter about impact real estate investing. You'll be among the first to hear about new projects you can invest in. That's evepicker.com. Thanks so much.